Hello, and this is Marcus. Can you hear me all right? Yes, now I can hear you. I can see your screen. And you should see a green screen at this moment. Yep. Yes. Yes, I can see it. It was the loading. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, so glad that we have that sorted. Uh, warm welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very glad to be speaking. I'm very honored to be speaking um, at this OpenSUSE LibreOffice conference. Um, and the subject of my talk will be powering the jump. Um, how we enable a new delivery model um, for what OpenSUSE is looking to achieve with Jump um, with the help of the Open Build service. My name is Marcus Noga. I'm, I'm a relatively new joiner to SUSE. I'm Vice President for Solutions Technology. My group looks after um, everything uh, that includes solutions for end customers, as well as all the base technology, including the build service itself, um, but also level three support, security certifications, um, and everything we do for technical partners and technical partner certification. Um, I'm proud and honored um, to be here today with all of you. So let's talk a little bit about the Open Build Service, its history, and how it pertains to containers. Um, the Open Build Service is something that many of us just take for granted because it's there, it's invisible in the background. It does its job and it helps us turn source code into something that users trust and administrators trust and install on their system, which is binary executables uh, that everybody can work with. And the open build service has historically been about openness in any shape and form, um, whether we target RPMs, whether we target divine images, whether we target ISOs, or other new formats like containers that are upcoming and gaining a lot of traction. Um, so the open build service has completed a longer journey um, for adding container support as a first class citizen and that journey began in 2017, um, so three years ago, uh, when container building um, and the first capabilities to churn out container images on the basis of um, um, packages uh, was added to the tool. Um, and that led to a second milestone in 2018 um, when we figured out that um, all these containers also need to be registered somewhere. They need to become discoverable. They need to become downloadable in an easy way. Um, so Open Build Service added a built-in container registry with automated publishing potential. Um, and fast forward to 2020, I'm, I'm very happy that we've also added Helm chart support. So we can't just put out individual containers but entire assemblies of containers into services and into applications, and that the first V3 Helm chart is actually public and available on our registry at this very moment. The address of that registry, um, of the open build service registry, which you also see screenshotted on this document, is registry.opensuse.org. Um, and at the moment, um, we have about 1,100 containers in this registry. Okay, changing slightly, I think it's 1,089, um, but that's close enough to 1,100 to make that claim. Um, we're also running about 3,000 container builds every single day because the build service includes automated dependency management. So whenever a package um, that a container has a dependency on gets updated, OBS will automatically rebuild that container image and make it available on the registry. For all supported architectures, whether that's ARM 32-bit, uh, ARM 64-bit, the PowerPC solutions, Intel 64-bit, and other platforms, um, we, the Open Build Service Registry supports all flavors of container target architectures. And at the moment, um, we have about 40 gigabyte of images under management um, with the Open Build Service Registry. Um, it's easily accessible for you at the URL on the headline via podman commands um, um, that are also available from the command line. What makes the open build service so strong in a container environment and in a um, trusted environment is that it really engenders trust in the form of a secure software supply chain. 
So when you double click on any particular package, and I'll continue with the example of MariaDB, which was also depicted on the prior page. When you go and double click on any particular package, you can be sure uh, that that package is trustworthy because it's been signed um, using both notary and open container initiative conventions so that we have a rooted trust um, for where um, the binary comes from. You're also able um, to transparently see what went into the cake. Now we will show you how the sausage is made. Um, the build instructions for that very container are accessible from the repository. You can see the scripts, you can see the templates that created it, and you have the snapshot sources for each container available at the point of build. And this is a very important part of software trust. Which CIOs today really have transparency about their container landscape? Which of them are able to say with certainty, all my containers are patched against the latest vulnerability? Okay, maybe not the very latest because of the of Bluetooth vulnerability that became transparent yesterday night, doesn't hit servers, but the second latest, which might be boot hole or another prominent vulnerability. How do you see that your images are actually proof against these. It's only by having a root of trust, by having transparency about what went into building the container, and by having drill down and transparency on the sources for each of these containers. And this is where the build service is extremely strong um, because there's no outside dependencies and we're able to rebuild even extremely old packages um, based on that root of trust and um, open source uh, source code and build instruction repository approach that the OBS takes. How do these images get built? Um, when we further double click on the MariaDB example here, you can see that the build instructions uh, for that container um, come um, in the form of Kiwi instructions, um, this sort of an XML um, description file on this page, which shows us the author, which shows us the contact details, the specification, and then the kind of image that we use in order to create that particular um, that particular um, binary. And the build instructions for this can support all possible targets um, in modern enterprise compute, uh, whether it's Azure images, AWS images, virtual machine images, whether that's ISOs um, or containers, um, Kiwi allows you and the open build service allows you to create um, a multitude of targets automatically um, whenever sources get updated and committed um, based on um, that description and that matrix of targets and sources. The neat thing about building with Kiwi is also um, that you're able to create base containers uh, which have no from in a Docker fair file, which have no base container that they rely on. They can become the base of an entire system, which gets interesting, um, for example, with distro-less approaches um, to software distribution. And a lot of people um, in the Golang communities, for example, um, um, following static leading binary approaches should see the strengths of this fairly immediately. Of course, um, TV is not the only path and it's not a mandatory path. Um, our open builds Docker file based build templates um, with a few extra features and capabilities that take the manual out of uh, operating Docker. Needing to tag um, your containers with build tags. Um, that's something we have extensions for, and you can assign build tags or repositories automatically. And you're also able to choose um, whether in that Docker container you would like to reuse RPMs um, with the zipper run command that's commented out here on line 11, or whether you would like to put files in directly or compile files directly um, with the um, added names or copy lines in line 14 and 15 of this example file. Um, so you get full flexibility in an open world um, where it's any kind of um, package distribution format, any kind of container format, um, and the ability to transparently create from your sources, for your project, for your package, um, that broad variety of dependent binary outputs. Why should you do that? Um, 
because you get automated rebuilds for free, um, including always latest updates um, based on dependent packages. In a container world, it's also very convenient to see the full dependency graph. What are the affected containers uh, for my package update? Who's actually using this? And what do my downstream users look like for a library package, um, for a service package, or for anything that goes into a broader appliance-like container? Um, you can also very easily see and inspect images for build origins to have traceability in that secure software supply chain um, and auto-generated change logs that enable you to visually and humanely inspect um, what's going on with container updates. We're not alone um, in putting out this out. Um, so at this point, I want to give a big shout of thanks to our community the Open Build Service team would explicitly like to thank Markus Hüve, Tina Müller, Berthold Gunnraben, Oleg Gerko, and Neil Gompa for their strong contributions uh, to the Open Build Service. Um, it's only with contributors and with an active and engaged community um, that a platform like this can continue to evolve and continue to address everybody's needs. So thank you. Um, very, very well done, and we really appreciate your contributions. With that, I want to switch over a bit in the direction of building OpenSUSE and what are the changes and what are the new developments that this entails if we embark on a journey together that's currently proposed under the code name OpenSUSE Jump. So let's have a quick look at how OpenSUSE actually gets built today, what are some challenges about that? And what could we do to address that to become even better, even stronger, and dare I say, slightly greener in all of this together? So this is how OpenSUSE gets built today. It's really a single project built. We're taking all the sources um, from the enterprise distribution, SUSE Linux Enterprise, from the OpenSUSE factory, and we take all of these sources and inject them into an OpenSUSE Leap or OpenSUSE Tumbleweed environment. Um, and there's additional layers of projects that go atop of this. For example, for the ARM environments in the 32 and 64-bit, or for the PowerPC environment. Um, that's a grand total of more than 12,000 packages um, that get compiled with various flags and sort of uh, configurations into roughly 70,000, 71,000 packages per architecture. Um, and that compile process then gets frozen um, once we release. Um, and we continue to do backports, we continue to do maintenance updates. Um, the backports, particularly our service for SLE customers. Now you could look at this and say, well, this is very open, this is very transparent, we just take all the sources, we use that fantastic open build service engine that we have, and we churn out the binaries that are required to run this on any architecture. What's there not to like? Well, it turns out that there are a couple challenges and issues around us um, that I want to have a look at together with you. Right? So one of these challenges is we really don't have binary compatibility between OpenSUSE and SLE um, because we're compiling in slightly different chains, uh, slightly different compiler versions, slightly different layers that get added. So there's no clear one-on-one -on -one bitwise compatibility between the two. And that's actually a bit of a disadvantage here. End users um, who would like to use open universe packages, for example, um, have a bit of a challenge doing that, and the experience for end users could be better. It's hard to them to explain to them um, why the packages shouldn't directly, binarily work together. Um, the same thing is we have a bit of duplication of effort for the package developers, for the container maintainers, and more, because you at least need to configure and set things up uh, so that they work in both environments. Um, we also have a bit of an echo issue, um, because we're going to compute and compile everything twice. We're going to store everything twice. Um, and with the many, many gigabytes under management and the many, many thousands of compiles per day, 
Um, we have over 200 workers, for example, um, running and making these compiles. Um, there's also a bit of an echo footprint issue. Um, so the proposed approach with an open SUSE jump um, makes this interlinked much, much more explicitly. We take this SUSE internal component, the binaries, and we mirror these to the public open SUSE instance. Um, that's a huge win because suddenly we get binary compatibility because we can work directly with the binary. This also means that submissions to SUSE Linux Enterprise can be triggered directly from OpenSUSE, making SLE the first enterprise distribution that can really be developed in the public, uh, thanks to all of you. Mm -hmm. I want to say at this point that this isn't 100% possible for the entire SLE distribution. We couldn't take that completely public at that point because of certain requirements around software certifications. It's not just the software product that gets certified for certain kinds of federal and regulated and government users. It's also the software development process that gets certified. So we can't take the entire SLE and open it up, but this is the best step that we can take to become ever more open and to remain ever more open um, in an environment that brings OpenSUSE and SLE much closer together by making that jump. So what does that look like um, on the build service and what does that look like um, from a build approach perspective? Uh, here's what OpenSUSE jump will look like um, from that build perspective. So we're going to use multiple projects. Uh, and these projects will aggregate into an open source jump on a binary level. We can bring in SLE 15. We can bring in internal build service packages. We can bring in backports from open source more or less directly um, in a binary form as that black dotted binary stream. And at the same time, we can push requests and content um, sort of in the form of sources back into all these channels, that's the red arrows going the opposite direction. And that's this sort of two-pronged interaction where we open up everything we can except for that certified software development process. We move OpenSUSE and SLE much closer together and we achieve that binary compatibility which makes the world a lot easier for end users that consume the software, for administrators that work with it, um, and from a storage and footprint and general simplicity perspective. And that, in the end, gets installed on a system that can consume updates um, in a consistent form from any of the channels, uh, whether it's jump, whether it's backports, or whether it's the proper SLE itself. Um, the power of this really means that end users have more choice with less complexity um, and, and with more ease of mind because they know everything works together. We're happy to support this thanks to the power of the build service, which is running as an open build service for everything OpenSUSE and which is running as SUSE's internal version of the build service called IBS um, to power the SLE distribution itself and it's actually the same software, the same build environment um, that powers both of them in two separate instances, again, for certification reasons. Um, we'd love to make that jump together with you. And I know it's being discussed intensively at this conference. So here's the outlook. You can learn more in additional conference sessions on Leap and why both developers and companies should be interested in the Leap approach. My colleague Lubosch is giving these talks um, today and I believe tomorrow. Uh, there should also be recordings available. The next thing you can do is to keep current by joining the OpenSUSE project mailing list, um, where you will be involved in a vigorous discussion and involved in information flow on everything concerning OpenSUSE and the way we propose to build and the way we propose to integrate. And last but not least, if you're at this conference, because Libra offers is what interests you and what you thrive on, consider becoming an OpenSUSE developer as well. It's by your contributions that OpenSUSE, the open build service, and the general open source environment here in Europe can thrive and sort of continue to prosper in future. 
Thank you very much. And I'd be very happy to open up for questions at this point. Now you have to hit that button labeled unmute if you would like to ask a question in a big forum like this. Well, I'm pretty happy to see how well this is going. Um, so with this, this seemingly uh, interesting ambition of with OpenSUSE Jump, um, what, do you, what do you hope you'll get from this in the end? What, what, do you ex what do you want to achieve with this new uh, <laughs> sleep, sleep fusion? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing is probably simplicity for end users. No? I'm passionate about user experience and customer experience. And whenever I meet with my teams, to look at demos, to look at new things that they've created or new things from upstream that they've incorporated and packaged, I will put myself in the shoes of the end user and ask, is this simple? Is it easy? Would my 79-year-old um, mother uh, with a history of being challenged with IT systems actually understand this? Could she use this? What's the potential for tripping up? And I believe by getting binary compatibility between the distributions, we're removing a lot of potential for tripping up. In an age where more and more users are coming into Linux environments again, more and more cost-constrained households, adding secondary and tertiary devices for children, more and more enterprises going towards a Linux environment, and Windows administrators facing all kinds of challenges, having to retrain and relearn to, for example, deploy their enterprise applications on a Linux stack. Making things easy, foolproof, and fail-safe because stuff just works together out of the box is probably the biggest price that we can shoot for. Now, put yourselves into the shoes of a recent college graduate, half a year into the job, living in Mumbai, working for a large system integrator, and having a 20,000 word best practice guide to install and configure something, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to look bad in front of your boss and in front of the customer. The more stumbling blocks we move out of these people's ways, the more adoption we'll get, and that grows the power of open source for everyone. So removing these stumbling blocks, simplifying, and making the consumption experience as easy as sort of downloading something from an app store. Um, I think that's the main price that we can go for. The fact that we will also cut the echo footprint of what we do in half um, is, is a pleasant side effect. Wow, that's, I think, quite a bit more than I expected to hear on, on this. Um, but yeah, no, it makes sense to me. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how, how well has this been going so far? Um, so right now, this is being discussed intensively. Um, and I believe the proposal is being um, um, debated um, in various parts of the Open SUSE project as well as in um, SUSE itself. Um, I have my fingers crossed um, for this actually becoming reality. May I comment on this one? Please jump in. Thank you. This is Lubos speaking. Hi, uh, um, hey. very glad to have you here. <laughs> and thank you for the talk. Uh, talk. It was really interesting. Uh, so uh, regarding the progress, my slides will have a little bit of what you are asking, Neil. Uh, I will summarize where we are, what are the problematic parts. There are some problematic parts. There are some parts where we are fine. Uh, and there should be a sign off, uh, let's say go no go next week, whether we would like to proceed with the intermediate release, leap 15 to one, and basically enroll this into production before the leap 15 three is released, or whether we postpone it to the next release. So that may actually answer exactly what you are saying. Based on that meeting, we will see where we are. There is a bunch of conditions that we have to align with in order to actually proceed. Uh, I can share a link if you want to, but I will, I will also make it part of my presentation. You can also see uh, the confirmation of stakeholders for the decision on the OpenSUSE project on factoring. I believe that 